everyone, this is Shannon from That's So Poe, and I am kicking off my vlog for our trip on the Joko Cruise 2020. So Sush and I are on a cruise going to the Caribbean for Jonathan Colton, who is a musician, his kind of geeky nerd convention at sea. So we're on this cruise for a week. There's a ton of different comedians and musicians and performers, as well as a lot of really, really cool authors who are on board and it's kind of a bunch of panels and concerts such a fun time so we've been on this cruise once before um, uh, about four years ago and we decided to come this year which is their 10th sailing uh, and my parents are also gonna be on the cruise although they don't really want to be filmed so it'll be mainly just me and Sush and what we're doing I think that we're gonna have a fun time this week we're gonna do a lot of excursions we're gonna go to a lot of panels I'll film what I'm able to film but I think it should be a lot of fun I will see how much reading I get done this week I did read some on the plane right now I am reading uh, the end of the day by Claire North. That's something that I'm buddy reading with Rachel from Kalinati, who I will link below. And I'm about, I think about 70% through, maybe a little bit further. I was supposed to finish this before getting onto the cruise, but I ran out of time. So I will finish it while on the cruise. So far up to the 70% mark, it's a really different style. It's got almost a confusing way of writing where you're never quite sure what's going on in certain things and other things it's very episodic. Um, it's about a a guy, Charlie, who is the harbinger of death. And so he kind of goes before death. He's an employee of death and he goes and delivers gifts to people who are either being warned um, so that they can avoid death or he's just being sent as a courtesy um, to kind of honor them before they pass away. And so it's really interesting, a lot of discussions about what death is and a lot of kind of questions about what does it mean to live a full life and to honor somebody's life? And what um, does it mean to accept death? These sorts of things. It's also a very, very political book. Lots of things about things like global warming and about, um, you know, corruption and greed. So it's an interesting book. I'm not positive if it's for everybody, but I'm enjoying it. So we'll see how I like the ending. In any case, I will keep updating you guys as we do more things and as I read more. Uh, hope you enjoy this vlog. <laughs> Rough seas have uh, torn a wide swath through the backstage situation. It's like Antietam back there. It's just <laughs> Antietam with guitars. Uh, people, are, people are having uh, trouble to various degrees. So it's Sunday, March 8th. We've been on the cruise for a day now, and things are really nice and fun, although plans today were a little bit different from originally expected. Yesterday when we got on the cruise, it was so nice. We had this nice sail away. We watched a little orientation, and then we had a very nice dinner with my parents at the kind of formal dining room. I totally forgot to get any pictures, but the food was very nice. Um, and we got seated with some really cool people and just kind of talked talked about various stuff, but I actually had to leave dinner early because I was feeling terribly seasick. Um, we've been on cruises before and usually cruises have a lot of stabilizers and you don't feel too much motion, but apparently there was just a lot of wind and there was a lot of movement, a lot of waves, and the ship went through some pretty intense motion. So lots of people were actually feeling sick. Luckily, the ship had Dramamine, which is like a medicine that helps settle your stomach. 
So I took some of that and was able to recover and feel better, uh, which was great because then we made it to the opening night concert. So almost every night um, there is a show on Joko Cruise where various performers get up and they do comedy or they do music. And the first night is kind of like a variety show of a bunch of the different musicians. So obviously Jonathan Colton, who is you know, the person who the cruise is named after. He did a couple of songs and Paul and Storm, who are the kind of organizers of the cruise. They're another comedy singing duo. They did a couple of songs, which were great. Um, and then they had a ton of other people perform. I think the real standout was Vince Vince or Vance Gilbert? I'm not positive. I'll, I'll have to look that up, but I'll put a link below. Who was somebody, it's his first year performing on the cruise, but he's been performing for years and years and years. And it's just, oh my gosh, what a voice. What a beautiful voice. And just, I loved his guitar work. So he was a real crowd favorite, I think. So there were, and there was just a ton of cool stuff. So I took a couple of clips. I won't, um, go into too much detail about that because, you know, it's just concert stuff, but it was a lot of fun, even though there was a lot of motion. And we were lucky because we were in the later show. There's two showings, an early show and a late show because they um, don't have you know, a room big enough for every single person on the cruise to go view at the same time. So they do two shows each day. Um, but for the earlier show, a lot of the performers were feeling seasick too because of all the motion. So luckily by the time that we went, the motion had died down a little and people were feeling a little bit better. But yeah, that was unexpected. And then this morning, we were supposed to all go to this little um, island in the Bahamas. Uh, but the wind was too high and it was too dangerous. And so we couldn't get off the boat. Um, they said, you know, cause for this island, you have to get off onto like a little boat from the cruise ship to go to it. It's called tendering. Uh, and they're like, it's too dangerous. We can't do it. And it's supposed to get more windy over the course of the day. So all of the plans that everybody had for getting off and going onto this little island and, you know, snorkeling and doing various things had to be canceled. Uh, but that was okay because we needed some extra sleep. Um, in addition to not sleeping well that first night, because there was so much motion on the boat, the um, just even this week, we've not gotten enough sleep kind of trying to get ready and get here on time and everything like that. So it was actually really nice this morning. We got to get in a little bit of extra sleep. We got to take things slow, um, had like a nice little lunch with my stepfather, explore the ship. And then they set up a couple of extra events in the afternoon, one of which was what they call office hours. Um, John Scalzi had some office hours and Martha Wells had some office hours. Basically, they just show up and they just chat with you. And so we got to sit in a little group chatting with Martha Wells and hearing about her experiences, about things like, you know, working on the Ruxura novels and then kind of suddenly becoming really famous with the Murderbot series. And just lots of really interesting things. Um, it was a lot of fun hearing from her. She's clearly a big fan of so much in the SFF kind of media world. And so just hearing her thoughts on a bunch of things, um, hearing her talk about how different the process was for writing the uh, upcoming Murderbot novel versus all the novellas. She was saying it took a lot longer than it normally does. So usually she said for her, for like her Ruxera novels, it would take maybe 11 months to write a book but the upcoming Murderbot one took 18 months and she was like yeah it was so long and she was such a cool person just really chill um and had a ton of fun just talking to her about other things things like what's going on with Macmillan because she her publisher is Tor.com and so Tor.com is owned by Tor and then Tor is within the Macmillan publishing group and she's like yeah like we have no control over what's going on what Macmillan is doing it's it's very frustrating and she said she gets like some really nasty emails from fans who are just like why would you you know do this and why would you not support the libraries and she's like I have no control over it so it's just really interesting she was so nice and uh, I made her take a picture with me as well <laughs> but it was just so cool and just talking to her also about other things she's reading Spinning Silver right now which I love and oh and she also really likes um Kaya Shanti Wilson. So that's another person who has novellas out with Tor.com. And she really likes 
Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps, which I know is a book that I really like, and um, I first heard about it from John and Bex over at Night Hunter Books. I'll link them below, although they haven't made uh, any videos in the past half year or so, so I'm not sure if they're still active. Also, Ava at Ava Strange, I'll link her below. She's another person who I know loves this novel, uh, novella. And so it's just so cool to kind of geek out together about how beautiful that um, novel is. So... Yeah, so even though plans didn't go exactly as expected today, it still ended up being really nice. I also got in a little bit more reading. I read a little bit more of The End of the Day by Claire North, and um, I, I'm really enjoying it. It's definitely an interesting book. You know, there's so much in it that you don't fully understand what's going on, and there's a lot of confusion about it. But I still really am enjoying it. I definitely cried multiple times in this. I'm kind of at the peak of it. I'm at 80% right now. And, you know, just there's a lot of emotions just around this idea of what people feel at the end of something, the end of something and the beginning of something else. And so this idea of death coming not just for people, but for ideas and for lifestyles, the end of one way. Um, they refer to it often as uh, the end of a world, right? So the ending of a world and the beginning of something new. So it's just, it's actually got a lot of really beautiful messages and I'm, I'm enjoying it. So I will keep reading that as we go. And tonight we're just going to go again to dinner. I'll try to actually remember to take some video of that. And then we'll see what the concert is tonight. I think it might actually be comedy tonight instead of concert, but we'll see. In any case, I will check in with you guys again, maybe tomorrow. Pablo asks, civility, a genuine plea for common understanding, or just another tool to oppress? And I answer, I mean, why not both? <laughs> Which is to say one can genuinely wish for civility, a sort of courtly and dignified mode of discourse, without understanding all the ways that civility generally favors the more powerful parties in this discourse and can be used to mask or minimize within the discourse wholly awful ideas, events, and opinions. Even the less formal uh, versions of the desire for civility, the plaintive cries of be nice, or can't we all get along, have within them the same dichotomy. And this is why, almost inevitably, calls for civility are usually issued by those who have power or belong to a powerful group, because it is a rhetorical system of control whether the person issuing the call consciously realizes it or not. Which is why people who are not on the inside are wary of calls for civility. They are being told that in order to be heard, they have to engage in a rhetorical system in which the value of their actual injury is held to be the equivalent to the value of the emotional investment in the other, the other side's emotional investment in the rules of discussion. Yes, you are suffering, but you are also rude to me about it, so my suffering is the same. Which is, you know, bullshit. And the injured know it, even if the person calling for civility does not. So that's why Trail of Lightning is set uh, on a near future Navajo reservation, uh, because I was living on the res at the time. Uh, and I looked out sort of my window and looked at the people around me and were like, if anyone's going to survive the apocalypse, it's going to be these people. Uh, because natives have already survived our own apocalypse uh, in a lot of ways. All of these sort of tropes of dystopian novels 
They should take your children away and put them in schools to make them conform, how they you know, take your land and separate you from your home. All those things have already happened to us. Um, and we are still here and we are still surviving. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> bring it on, don't bring it on. Uh, <laughs> Yes, so Star Wars. I wrote a Star Wars. Um, how did that happen? <laughs> Who the hell knows? Um, I get an email from my agent that's like, listen, I know you're busy, you don't want to take on any more projects, but Star Wars calls. <laughs> and I was like, I will drop everything and I will write a Star Wars. Uh, so they reached out to me. Uh, I think, you know, I have a theory about the way it started is actually from Twitter. Uh, I, uh, when A Certain Point of View came out, which is a collection of Star Wars short stories by a lot of different sci-fi authors, uh, I was like, oh, they should have included a native author. I wasn't thinking of me because I'm still fairly new-ish, you know. Uh, I was thinking of someone with a lot more chops and experience. Um, but that's fine. Uh, so I did this Twitter that was like, let a native author write a Star Wars story. And then I talked about all the native influences in Star Wars. So for those of you who don't know, of course, Princess Leia's Lights. hair is a woman hairstyle. The Ewoks come from the Miwok tribe of uh, Northern California. Uh, when Princess Leia walks into Jabba Hutt's lair in her bounty hunter uh, costume, she says, Yate, Yate, which is, of course, you should know by now. Go lightning, hello, and arrow. So I was like, where are the natives? Uh, so I guess that got around. And um, Jen Peddle, who's the executive editor of this film, saw it. And Joe Monty, who's my editor on the 12 Viking books, knows her. And they chat and chat. And they called me and asked me if I would do it. And I said, absolutely, yes. And then they were like, you have four months. Don't. <laughs> and I cried a lot. And then I said, OK, sure. <laughs> Are you dressed as an X-Wing pilot? OK, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, uh, do you think of Murderbot as being kind of a, a reaction to the sort of uh, sexism and racism of um, noir stories like uh, National Anthem uh, kind of stuff at all? A reaction to the to the sexism uh, of, 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 of the noir <laughs> of noir. Um, it probably is a reaction to sexism in general. Um, because I react a lot to sexism. Um, I've seen a lot of it <laughs> uh, over the years. Um, you get it as a young woman writer, you get it as a middle-aged young, oh, middle-aged woman writer, you get it as an old woman writer. It's just different brands. So uh, it probably is. And actually, each of the novellas, I wasn't thinking of it because I wasn't thinking of anything. I just wrote all systems ready. Right? Uh, but with artificial condition and road protocol and uh, exit strategy, I tried to make them each a little bit of a different genre. Like uh, artificial condition is very noir. Um, the comfort unit is kind of fulfilling the role of the femme fatale. Um, and then in road protocol, uh, there's a line where Murderbot references um, watching a show where these people are on an alien planet and monsters are attacking them and they drag off the biologist to eat them and, and it's like, that's exactly what we're designed to prevent. And um, that's kind of, and in the story, that's sort of almost what happens in the story. So it's kind of more the alien horror kind of thing like the aliens movie. It's, it's interesting to think of movies like how would Murderbot react to aliens or something. It's like, there would have been an awful lot of dead aliens and probably humans who were never allowed to get off the ship. <laughs> um, you gotta nip that right in the butt. You can't let that go on. Um, so yeah, I think exit strategy. Um, I think was more suspense, thriller, kind of oceans eight, kind of Oceans eleven, kind of escape. All all the oceans, uh, kind of uh, you know, escape from the the big thing. So. Do you have advice on creating terrifying characters? Oh. Uh, <laughs> have scary dreams, right? <laughs> um, that that's all. Well, I mean, the woman in white is is uh, in in this novel. Um, those of you who read *The City Born Great* are aware that there is uh, a, a vaguely Lovecraftian element to the story. Um, but I wanted to kind of play with the Lovecraftian element in that um, she is a collection of some of my fears. 
Um, she is like an uber white woman. Like, like every stereotype of a white woman she embodies and Karen. existential evil. What? Is she Karen? <laughs> uh, no, she doesn't have a name. Her name is the woman in white. Scratch that, let me clarify. She does have a name. You will know her name one day. <laughs> um, I can't spoil that for you though, sorry. Um, but she can go by Karen, she'll go by any name that you want to give her. Um, and she appears in various forms throughout the story, um, very often with, let me speak to the manager here, um, and so forth. Um, so, you know, but she, she, I want her to be existentially creepy, but I'm also, of course, this is a story of people I'm also, once again, hitting stereotypes in the face. I'm trying to poke at this as well. Um, and so we'll see how that goes. Um, and I just write that scariness because it, there are things that, like, people who were, too, who were too friendly scare me. There's no logic to it. Maybe it's like the, the, the New Yorker in me where I'm like, oh. And then like the Southerner in me is like, but that's fine. And then the New Yorker in me is constantly like, they want something, you know? So. I don't know, I was just trying to channel that. Um, so you just channel what actually scares you and write that down. So today is Monday, March 9th, and we've had another day on the cruise, lots of fun stuff. Last night after I checked in, we um, had dinner, it was great, and then we went to the evening concert, which last night was actually um, a bunch of stand-up acts. So that was really cool, they didn't allow any recording though, so I don't have any footage of it, but I did really like uh, Mike Kaplan. He is a comedian that I haven't heard any bits from before, so that was a lot of fun, definitely had me laughing a lot. And then today was at sea, and we had like a whole day of book related stuff. Oh, and I forgot to mention, last night I did finish the book that I was reading, The End of the Day by Claire North, and that was interesting. So the ending got a little violent. Um, there had been some bits earlier in the book that were a little bit uh, graphic, but the ending had quite a bit, and that was a bit much for me. I don't usually like graphic violence in my books, so that was... I, I definitely wasn't sure how much I wanted to continue with that, but I did finish it. And overall, I kind of, I enjoyed the thoughts. There were a lot of thought-provoking ideas and messages in the book. That was definitely very cool, sort of what is the purpose of life and what do you do when a way of life is ending? So lots of really cool ideas, but I think that sometimes the violence got a bit much for me. And there is this weirdness where sometimes those messages were a little bit heavy-handed, a little overbearing, while at the same time the story itself was kind of vague and confusing. So I think that this book had some interesting things to get you to think about, but I'm not necessarily positive I always loved the delivery of it. Although I did, um, in many cases, find the writing engaging and it wasn't hard to get through, but still, a couple of issues. Also, I'm pretty sure that this book was written right around 2016, and it feels very much like somebody trying to just process that feeling that the world is ending, that everything is going wrong. How do we find joy and hope and life when everything that you believed was okay is getting worse, right? So I get it as that kind of book. Um, so yeah, any, in any case, I did finish that book. And then today we had a bunch of book related events. So there were a number of author readings. This morning we went to John Scalzi. He read um, from his newest book, I believe, in the Collapsing Empire series. And that is something that I have not read, but I really want to. I loved the uh, chapter that he read. I think it's from the perspective of Kiva. It was just very, very funny. I loved the character and I really want to read more about her. And then um, he did a Q&A. That was really interesting. He had uh, also, he read something from 
I I don't know if it's a blog post or something like that, talking about civility and the privilege that goes along with that. That was super cool. And then we saw Rebecca Roanhorse talk. Um, She read from a couple of different things. She read from some short stories, uh, some of which I had read before. And also, oh, she read from an upcoming epic fantasy that she's building. And so it's cool because it's kind of this pre-Columbian um, native inspired fantasy world. And I think it's going to, it just sounds like it's going to be so epic. Uh, and she's like, yes, and I've got two maps in their full color and all sorts of cool stuff. So she's really excited too. I'm very interested in that when that comes out. I I feel like maybe Black Suns is the name of the, the book. I'm not positive, but uh, I'll look that up and link the information below. So I'm really excited about that. And she did some Q&A as well, talking about things like, you know, what her background is and how she used to be in, um, uh, used to be a lawyer and deal with some issues relating to tribal lands and stuff like that and how she got into writing and all, all sorts of cool stuff. And then we saw Martha Wells speak and Martha Wells read some Murderbot stuff and that was just so funny. Uh, She also, she said, wrote that around the time of 2016 and just so much of Murderbot's anger and frustration is kind of her anger and frustration and that was so cool. I could definitely hear it, you know, um, that humor and annoyance with the world. It it really worked. It was so much fun hearing her read as well. And then there was N.K. Jemisin, and N.K. Jemisin read from her upcoming book, uh, The City We Became. That was very cool, too, and answered a lot of questions talking about kind of her inspiration and how she deals with, you know, being a Black woman in the SFF field and how to avoid or uh, subvert stereotypes, all sorts of cool discussions. So today was real cool. I I think this was one of the things we were most looking forward to. Um, going forward, there's going to be a lot of other things, especially islands that we're going to, some excursions onto shore, that sort of thing. But today was the big author event. And I also started a new book. I started The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern, which is one of the books that is nominated for the BookTube SFF Awards. Uh, My library has like a super long wait list for this, something like hmm, 12 or 14 weeks. But they have these lucky copies where you can kind of skip the line and get a shorter uh, borrowing period. And that had happened a couple of weeks ago. And so I decided to just go ahead and get that. And my loan is almost expired. So I'm trying to get that done. So I started reading it. I'm only like just a little bit in, but I really like the writing style. So I'm enjoying it. And yeah, just kind of having a fun time. And I will check in with you guys uh, tomorrow. uh, As part of San Francisco Sketch Fest, Worst First Chapter. For those of you unfamiliar with this, it's pretty easy. We ask some people to write an intentionally terrible first chapter to a bad book that does not actually exist. With the current, but of course, like salmon, can swim upstream through space, there are some time salmon beings who can swim up the time stream. Oh, and did I mention uh, that these time doctors are time doctors because of the fact that they are time salmon beings who can travel up the time stream and also down it like regular and also side to side fish don't go just in a straight line you know you know this you you my audience who bought the book you i know you 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 know things like i also i just told you so you know it you you certainly know it if you're like i still don't know it then how did you even hear me you know uh so all right You all know how the game is played, but just as a reminder for our folks watching at home, I will present a series of 10 questions. The question will go on the screen. Ken will attempt to answer that question. At that point, I will project three multiple choice options for the audience to vote on by their applause. If Ken guesses correctly, he receives two points. If the audience guesses correctly, they receive one point. Just to be clear, they've already heard me answer. That is 100% correct. I don't get any choices. I just have to say a thing. You get no prompts beside a question. It's you versus trivia. For all the marbles, are you ready to play Ken Jennings versus Choco Cruz? I'm going to give it a shot. If I say no, I don't know who you get. I'm going to give it a shot. John Roderick, do you have any predictions for tonight's game? I feel like it's going to be close. (laughs) The audience does get to choose from multiple choice. 
choices. This is true. True. One of which is always probably going to be a comedy choice. Well, an attempted comedy choice, probably, but yes. Tim's pretty smart, though. He is, apparently. But you keep in mind that intelligence is not cumulative. You know, these people are about 900 times smarter than one of them because some of them could be just yelling out dumb answers and keeping and keeping the rest of the team. I like everyone knows who that's my job, baby. <laughs> Apparently you're familiar with the red team, Kev. <laughs> All right, on that note. I always forget. There's one team that's been drinking and one team that hasn't. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really funny how close any group of people is to fascism. <laughs> just like, just a hair's breadth away. off of, of Spurney's, I guess, but that doesn't seem right. No, no, you keep it. It's your set list. It's my error. And I'm the one who should suffer. No, I made a mistake. It's not like I'm going to ask somebody else to fix my problem. Will somebody please go get my set list? For me? <laughs> and to Amy's, too, it looks very similar. <laughs> they look alike. I hope they're identical, otherwise it's going to be a very interesting show. <laughs> Because as you know, musicians always play whatever is next on the set list, even if the, the rule is that if you start a song, you have to finish the song, even if it's the wrong song, and the band is playing a different song. You've never, you've never adhered to that rule. <laughs> That's the kind of maverick I am, I guess. <laughs> silence. What's important to remember is that we're on a boat. May I ask you a question? No. Okay. Never mind that. You want to see sports writers write about Jeopardy? They understand the strategy and the, the gaming aspects of it, which is really what it is. And when TV writers write about Jeopardy, they treat it as an entertainment show. And I know that's what it is, but that's not how you write it up, because that's not what it is at its, the core of it is the game. So Jeopardy will say things like, hey, maybe you should take the uh, categories in order. Like, that, that's, a, that's a way to play, because unless you get your toe in and understand the material before you get to the higher dollar amounts where there's really more cash on the line. 
And they're not wrong, but they also know that they have a change-averse audience of uh, lovely, lovely senior citizens <laughs> who do not like when somebody plays the game differently or confusing them. And maybe there's strategic reasons to play the game differently. Um, James tended to start from the bottom up, which is just a genius thing I've never seen before. You know, I've seen people hunt for daily doubles. Daily doubles are the crux of the game, and they're underappreciated. It's a chance. Final Jeopardy, too many people leave the game to Final Jeopardy. Final Jeopardy A is much harder. Final Jeopardy conversion is around 47% this year, whereas daily double conversion is like in the 70s. So the questions are much easier. The clues, sorry. The clues are much easier. So I'm never going to replace Alex if I keep saying questions and answers instead of clues and responses. Uh, and also, you're the only one playing. On Final Jeopardy, everybody gets a crack at the ball. Like, why would you not want this free throw, this extra point where it's just you? So the game often hinges on the Daily Doubles. And James figured out not only they're that big on the Daily Doubles, because he's a professional gambler, but to start at the bottom of the board and rack up a ton of money. And here's why you want to do that. Because you're the returning champion, and every day they're bringing two new people off the street that are just scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> like, the longer you're here, it's, it's, very, it's a stressful experience. It is not like the game at home. Like, you feel like the questions are coming at you like artillery, the clues. And, but every day you're there, you get a little more accustomed to it. Um, day two, easier than day one, right? Day three is on Monday. Oh, yeah, day is on Monday, so you've lost it all overnight, right? Yeah. Day five, easier than day four, I'm sure. Um, and the longer you're here, the more of an advantage you have, and yet every day, fresh meat right off the truck. Uh, it's not super fair. And so James' idea was, while most people are still figuring out what's going on, like, vacuum up all the money on the board, find a daily double, double up. By the time you go to commercial, you're up uh, 8,000 to zero to zero, and they have just mentally checked out of the game. Uh, and it turned out to be very smart. Shock and awe, Jeff. I've never seen it. <laughs> How much effect does it have if the character you start with as a protagonist is female as opposed to male? Does it affect your world at all? Does it affect the the, the slice of it you see, the way it's designed, does it matter? Uh, yeah, it does. It, um, everything about the character matters. The, their situation in life, everything about, you know, are they someone who's fairly privileged? Are they someone who's, you know, on the bottom of a very harsh society, you know? And why are they on the bottom of that very harsh society? That's probably mm -hmm. one of the things that matters the most, right? But yeah, I mean, everything about them. Right. Yeah, no, I'll echo that. I mean, a lot of it also depends on the setting that you put them in. Uh, in the world of the interdependency, uh, the majority of the point of view characters that I have are women, uh, but also that particular society does not penalize women in the same way that our society does, and that makes it different. When I did lock-in, uh, I knew that my primary character was going to be viewed from, uh, by the rest of the world through a android body. Uh, and that android body did not, not either have to have sex or gender. Um, so from the point of view of the book, uh, Chris's gender is never revealed. And that's been really interesting because I did that as an exercise, but I've had critics of the book, not like critics like people like you suck, but just people who are looking at it, um, making arguments, no, Chris is very definitely a male, or Chris is very definitely a female, because of the way that I have written that character, and it's super fascinating to read. I don't know uh, Chris's gender because I never asked Chris, but it's entirely possible that Chris does have a gender, uh, and the fact that people are really doing that sort of exegesis is really interesting to me. The concept of a canon is good on its face. The concept of, you know, uh, we as speakers of a similar language, people who come from a similar culture, um, so much of our media is riffing on the same stories that it's kind of helpful if we are riffing on the, that we at least know what's being riffed upon. The thing is, there's so many cultures involved in our culture. And, and the idea that we are truly just one culture versus an amalgam of like many, 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 
um, that's where the problem lies. And so, and, and our canon as it has existed um, has in fact privileged one culture over all. Um, and so it's impossible to have that be a canon that is representative of so many cultures, so many languages, so many people. Um, even if we are interacting, even if we are related, even if we are increasingly global, um, it is impossible for that canon to be useful past a certain point, unless you intend to use that canon to reinforce the power dynamics that have existed for far too long. Um, and some people do, uh, but I don't think that we should. So I think that we can create new canons that are respective to um, the subgroupings of our cultures. Um, those canons can maybe talk to each other, but they don't have to. Um, and I think that we, maybe it's time for us to have many canons instead of one. And I would just echo, I like this idea of many canons. Um, I tend to think that canons create rules, and generally for creativity, rules are bad. And I am not, I grew up reading a lot of science fiction and fantasy, but I was very unfamiliar with this concept of canon or sort of the formality of uh, a science fiction and fantasy culture. Uh, so I just read whatever interested me, and if it was grouped in science fiction and fantasy, great. If it was grouped in romance, great. If it was grouped in some other genre, uh, that was great too. Uh, so I like a lot of the mixing of genres and a lot of sort of breaking the rules of canon. And I'm one of those people that, I'm going to say this out loud, and hopefully I still have people who will read my stuff, but I never read Tolkien, for example. And I know that's... <laughs> sinners, all of you! Um, I know that, you know, that's sort of anathema, but that was not something that appealed to me. I love the movies. I was obsessed with the movies. Uh, but the books themselves, I just, it did not work. I will argue and have argued and will continue to argue for as long as people want to have this argument, which is forever, um, that the movies of The Lord of the Rings are better from a storytelling experience. So it is now Wednesday, March 11th. Um, I skipped yesterday because it was a busy day, but let me fill you in on what we've been up to. So on Monday night, um, after dinner, we were lazy and we stayed in our stateroom to watch on the TV the simultaneously broadcast um, concert in the main concert hall. And they were doing a variety night, which was a lot of fun. Um, they just had a bunch of people doing kind of fun little game games. Um, one of them, for example, was they did a chapter of the worst book ever written. And so they had some people, some writers come up with these fake little chapters. Uh, Mike Kaplan, who was one of the comedians I'd really liked on the stand-up night, did one about um, time. And that was quite cute. I really, I really liked his humor. Uh, and later they had Ken Jennings do a trivia game. And it was Ken Jennings versus the rest of Joko Cruz. But they majorly handicapped him. Um, and they made him just do free response answers. Um, and then for the rest of the people on the cruise, we got multiple choice answers after Ken Jennings had already answered. And so it was just fun. Ken Jennings was such a great sport. And it was just, it was um, really silly and cute. So that was a, a nice evening, and we really enjoyed just being lazy and watching it from bed. Uh, and then on Tuesday, we had a great time because that was when we were at the port of Santo Domingo. And so we had booked an excursion with my parents, and we went on a tour with a group um, looking at the kind of old Santo Domingo, so some of the old buildings, some of the history of it. And that was a lot of fun. I love going on history walking tours. And for this, we just walked through um, a bunch of the old city, and we saw some of the historic buildings. For example, the place, the palace, where Christopher Columbus's son had lived when he was the governor of the colonies. Um, and they had, you know, put in historical furniture and all this sort of stuff. And I love, 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 love old furniture. I'm just so into that. So I love house museums. That was a lot of fun. And we also went to one of the cathedrals, which was gorgeous. I also love going to see churches and things like that, where you just have that really um, 
kind of luxurious decorations and beautiful architecture and paintings and you know uh, all sorts of just gorgeous things so I love going on walking tours I love historical stuff I love buildings I love architecture it was just a lot of fun so we enjoyed that and then we rested in the afternoon uh, because in the evening there was the land concert. So in Santo Domingo, actually in the old town, uh, they put on a concert and they had a bunch of the people who were on the cruise do the do some sets. Uh, we were a little tired, so I skipped some of the earlier sets, went to dinner with um, Sush and my parents. And then Sush was tired so and my mom was tired, so they stayed back. But my stepfather and I went to the land concert and caught the Jonathan Colton sets. And it was fun because my stepfather hadn't actually heard Jonathan Colton's music before. And so he's like, oh, I see a lot. It's very funny. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, so I had a great time. Just a lot of old classic songs that he does and a lot of newer ones. And um, it was just a lot of fun to watch everybody get into it and sing along. So that was a lot of fun. And then today we've been at sea and we have gotten to see a couple of cool panels today. So in the morning, Ken Jennings was doing just a chat. So he talked a little bit about himself and then did a Q&A. Uh, he seems like the most chill, nice person it was kind of just a joy to watch him talk about his love of trivia and how he got into playing Jeopardy um, and what his life has been like after that, becoming an author, uh, writing all of these trivia type books. So it was just really enjoyable to watch him talk about how fun it is to just nerd out. Um, and in the afternoon, we saw two panels, one called Space Opera and one called The New Canon. So both of these were moderated by John Scalzi, uh, but they were missing a couple of members because due to issues with like coronavirus a number of the performers couldn't make it so that just has like shortened the the number of people on panels but the uh, space opera one was fun. That was between John Scalzi and Martha Wells. And they were just talking about, you know, the space operas that they grew up with, how space opera um, has different kind of subgenres, how things have changed. Also talking about just what they like about space opera. So it was a lot of really interesting discussions. And they had um, kind of a fun thing where somebody asked, you know, what's your favorite kind of problematic classic uh, space opera writer and they're like yeah basically everything basically everything before 2005 is pretty problematic <laughs> um so that was kind of fun uh and just again I really like listening to Martha Wells talk she's so funny and relatable I really like that and John Scalzi is really good as a moderator he's very good at moving things on and asking questions so he was also really wonderful to have there and then the next panel was the new canon and that was fascinating too so that's talking about how a lot of the classic canon in science fiction and fantasy is stuff that isn't necessarily um where we are now as modern readers and talking about how you know, we want to build this new canon, but there was just a lot of discussion of, of various things. Uh, and that panel had John Scalzi moderating, and then it had Rebecca Roanhorse and N.K. Jemison. And so both of them had really interesting things to say. Um, some stuff that I found was really interesting. Um, so they were asked, you know, who do you think is uh, somebody who would be part of the modern canon? And I liked their answers. Uh, Rebecca Roanhorse said that Tamsin Muir with Gideon the Ninth would be her choice because she thinks that what Gideon the Ninth does breaks so many boundaries of genre and brings in a lot of things that are much more like fanfic like um, brings in a lot of memes and modern language and just breaks down some of those barriers and she, she really liked that aspect of it which made me like much more interested in reading it in that lens um, you know, it's on the list for the BookTube SFF shortlist. And so it's one of those things that I thought maybe I'll get to, but it wasn't really high on my priority list because sometimes humor things can n not necessarily work for me. But treating it as a, a breakdown of 
barriers and gatekeeping. Now that's an interesting thing and that makes me curious about it. Um, and then N.K. Jemison was talking about how she thinks Martha Wells is somebody who is part of the new canon because she is someone who has basically brought back that feeling of classic pulp SF where you're just totally thoroughly engaged in the character's story and you want to know what happens next and I totally get that you know they talk they talked a little bit about um you know how classic SF you you know even if their parents had loved stuff they go and they read that and it's uh, you know Buck Rogers those sorts of things they can't get into it but when their parents describe that feeling of being thoroughly engaged and just wanting to know what happens next right um she talked about how that happens with Murderbot and I'm like 100% there I, I I just want to know what happens to Murderbot so those were really interesting answers and I I just thoroughly enjoyed the discussion so it's been a lot of fun um definitely there's plenty of other things going on in the programming that we're not really going to. We're kind of just doing a lot of the book events and then being a little lazy on the side of that. But there's tons of other stuff going on with to do with music and board gaming. Oh, we did go last night as well. There's a board gaming library. So they have like hundreds and hundreds of books that are available for you to check out and play. Um, and we played an escape room game with my stepfather. Um, it was one of the Unlocked, I think, series. And Sush and I before have played the Exit series, which is a different publisher, and really, really liked it. And we've done, you know, actual in-person escape rooms too, um, which we have failed each time. But uh, we really like the Exit board game uh, escape room. So we thought, oh, this would be fun. I did not like the one we picked. I think maybe it was also a harder one, but the clue system worked in a very different way. And I wasn't necessarily on board with some of the ways that the clues were handled. Um, and it went, it just ran way late and it was late already. And so, yeah, I wasn't so pleased with that one. I wonder if I should give Unlocked another try with a different, like one of the different games within that series, but I was, it didn't work for me. Um, also, maybe I should not play at like 11 p.m. because I'm not a night person. Anyway, so um, today, yeah, we went to the panels and oh, and I've been reading more of the Starless Sea. So I'm at maybe like 25%, maybe a little past that. Um, I'm definitely enjoying it. It's really, you know, Kazen at Always Doing had talked about how this is atmospheric fantasy. And I get that. It is beautiful, right? It is really, really beautiful in the way that it builds up the feel, right? The feel of it, the descriptions of the rooms, and that I really get into. And what's very interesting is it sort of alternates chapters. It's weird how many books I've read recently that alternate perspectives and chapters, or not perspectives, but storylines and chapters, almost like two separate stories. So every other chapter is about this guy named Zachary, and he is sort of discovering this portal world. Um, and the other alternating chapters are many different stories about the world. So like lots of just different fairy tales in a sense. And I'm really in love with the fairy tales. So Zachary's story is fine. It's fine. But I'm really in love with the fairy tales. I just read um, the one about the key collector. And like, I loved that. Like, I loved that feel. It's true, you know, that fairy tale feel and the slightly, I don't know, absurd in terms of, of weird things happening. And I just really loved that. So I'm very into the atmosphere, although I can totally see how people, you know, feel like it doesn't necessarily have um, as much character or storyline as some other books. But apparently I just really like short stories and the short stories of little the little fairy tales within this are really working for me. So we'll see where this goes, but I'm, I'm really enjoying it so far. So that's good. Uh, and oh, and then the other thing that happened was <laughs> they've had another schedule change. So I feel so, so sorry for the people who are organizing this cruise because it's been a lot of, a lot of changing things, a lot of things that have needed adapting to. And one of the things that changed was tomorrow where you were supposed to go to Grand Turks and Grand Turk and Ka Kaikos, something. It's an island, but Grand Turks, I think. And um, apparently they just changed while we've been at sea. They changed the rules and regulations for entry onto the island, probably to do with coronavirus as to where you, um, like where your passport is from. 
And so that would have excluded a number of people from getting off of the island. So they decided instead that we we're going to go back to uh, the island that we were supposed to stop on like the original second day of the cruise, but that we'd had stormy weather and couldn't go to. So apparently we're going to go back to that and stop there on, on Friday instead. And yeah, so that's been like a whole shifting of plans, but it's it's definitely been an adventure uh, this year. Lots of things have been up in the air because of everything that's been going on with coronavirus. They have been taking real good um, care on the ship, though. Like, everybody who works on the ship, they have these enormous jugs of uh, hand sanitizer. And, like, wherever you go, there are people being like, please use hand sanitizer. And, like, anytime you enter any place where food is, they make you use hand sanitizer. So um, they're definitely working on it. But, yeah, it's it's been interesting. And we will see how everything goes. Tomorrow is another at sea day. We may go to some panels. We may take it easy. I don't know. We may play board games. So I will check in with you soonish, uh, either tomorrow or the next day. And I will hopefully get a little bit more of the Starless Sea Red. It's a disaster. Jonathan is sick. He can't even stand up. He's totally out. Jonathan Colton, Jonathan? Do you know any other Jonathans? There's usually three or four of them performing on this cruise. But what, what happened? Well, you know Jonathan, he's always touching his face and making other people touch his face. <laughs> So it's Friday, March 13th, and we've had a couple of relaxing days. I think I last checked in on Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday evening was very relaxed. There was no concert or anything in the evening. So we had a nice chill evening um, and read a bit. Then on Thursday, yesterday, we had a great day at sea. Uh, originally that had been planned to be an excursion to Grand Turk, um, but because of the regulations, they changed it. And so we had an at sea day on Thursday and that ended up being perfect for us. Sush and I just had a really relaxing day. Um, my mom had some work she wanted to get done and my stepfather had a ton of things that he wanted to go do. He loves to play games and has been making all sorts of friends on the Joko cruise. But Sush and I took it real easy. 
we just did things like had a relaxing breakfast and read some and we borrowed a couple of games from the 24-hour game library so we played azul which was so much fun absolutely loved that game it's kind of like a tile game where you have different colors of tiles and you have to fill up your board that was a lot of fun i think we might get it it was it was great um we also played another game called photosynthesis which is about growing your own trees. It reminded me a little bit of um, Stardew Valley, which is a video game that Sush had gotten me over for Christmas that I'd played a lot of. You In that game, you farm and you can also grow trees. So it just reminded me of that. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then other than that, I just kind of read a lot. Um, I got through a bit more of the Starless Sea, so I'm now at around 70%, and it's gotten really, really good. Um, the beginning, I loved the atmosphere, and I loved the fairy tales that were kind of interwoven, but the story of the main character, Zachary, it was like so-so on, but now we're in that part where the fairy tales and Zachary's story are kind of interweaving, and that is very, very cool. I'm enjoying that a lot. Also, um, I'm really liking how this book is turning out to be a mystery. Like, the story was very mysterious in the beginning, but now it's turned into an actual mystery with clues and hints and things to figure out and aha moments, and I'm finding that I really like books that are mysteries. So that's been fun. I'm at 70% and I have another 30% to go by tonight and it's already 7 p.m. something like that so we'll see if I get it read um there's also a concert tonight so I, I will see but I definitely have enjoyed what I've read of it so far uh, I definitely want to finish it so I'm gonna try real hard to get it read before my library copy goes away um it's just it's really beautiful writing and I'm thoroughly engaged in it so I'm having a great time um but yeah so that was kind of what we did yesterday and in the evening we uh didn't go to the formal main dining room we just picked up some food from the buffet and had super super low-key evening we didn't even go in person to the concert that night we just watched it from the tv in our room and I think we're gonna do that tonight too because we were like hey you get better seats that way in a sense um and we're not like huge on crowds so last night there was I think Paul and Storm who are two of the organizers of the of the cruise they performed and then uh, Vance Gilbert, who does like the nice folk music with the guitar work. Um, and then it was very fun. They put on a, um, a very cute little musical uh, show that they put together last minute. One of the performers who was supposed to come had a fever and because of the whole coronavirus thing, nobody with a fever was allowed on board, so she couldn't come and perform like she was supposed to. So a bunch of the other performers last minute put together a kind of like a, a cute little musical about Joko Cruise, and that was just a ton of fun to watch. So that was that was actually a really neat treat. Um, and then today, Friday, is kind of the last day on the cruise. So this morning we were docked at Half Moon K, Half Moon Key, which is like a private little bitty island owned by the cruise line and in the Bahamas. And basically we just got off the boat and wandered around the beach and also went on to a glass bottom boat tour. Um, the glass bottom part of the boat wasn't so visible actually, but just from over the side of the boat you could see a ton of fish and we saw like a barracuda and it was just really, really neat. So we had fun with that. And then, um, after that, we came back and we played another board game with my mom called Mill Millsborn, something like that. And uh, it's a game that she knew from her childhood, um, and it was in the game library and she wanted to play it. It's kind of like a cute card uh, racing game where you're trying to go forward, but there's accidents and things like that. So we had fun playing with her while my stepfather was out snorkeling. Uh, and then, yeah, we had dinner with them, and now we're just going to pack up everything because we have to get our luggage ready and out of our stateroom tonight uh, and watch the show on the TV. So I will probably do a few more clips kind of of uh, through the airport when I'm reading that sort of thing and maybe wrap up at the very end. But this is basically the last last couple of hours of the cruise um, other than sleeping tonight. So I will check in with you guys when we get back home and uh, that's it for now.
Fish and I are now back home and I wanted to go ahead and wrap up this vlog. Uh, I had a fun time making this vlog, although I'm sure it's way too long yet again. I seem to not know how to make short vlogs, but we had a great time. Um, on the flight back, I did get a little bit more reading done. Um, I wasn't able to finish the Starless Sea on my library loan copy that expired the last night of the cruise and I fell asleep early. I was just too tired. But I decided to go ahead and just buy myself an e-copy on Kindle so that I could finish the book. The hold at my library is, you know, like 10 weeks and that was just going to be a little too long. One, because that would be, I think, maybe past when we need to vote for the Book 2 Best of F Awards. And then also the story in the Starless Sea has enough complexity that I thought it might be hard for me to remember the details and put all the pieces together if I had that big of a gap. So I just went ahead and bought the ebook copy, um, especially because I think Sush might enjoy reading this as well. I might read it out loud to him even. So I bought that and I was able to finish it on the plane. I had about 25% left and I, I really, I enjoyed the ending. I really liked just the way that the fairy tales all kind of mixed in with the story of Zachary, that was really cool. And the kind of themes of endings as well, that was very interesting to have that right after having finished The End of the Day by Claire North, which talked about endings and beginnings, and then Starless Sea had the same themes. So that was really curious. Um, I liked a lot of that part of it, although in the last, I don't know, maybe 20%, they introduced another point of view, which was somebody back in like the real world. And that I found a bit jarring again. I just wasn't as into the stuff that happened not in the Starless Sea. And the point of view that they introduced was something with a very modern type of writing style. And it just didn't work for me. I liked the lush kind of fairy tale feel of what was going on in the Starless Sea. And every time we went to that other perspective, it was a little bit not to my style. Um, it was also a bit more of like a spy thriller in the real world versus the kind of more mysterious fairy tale feel in the Starless Sea. So overall, I, I did really, really enjoy a lot of parts of it, but I could have dealt with a story that took place just in the Starless Sea. So I, I still really enjoyed it. I definitely need to read The Night Circus because that was very cool. Um, and then other than that, I read a little bit of two other books. So I read a little bit of A Place for Us by Fatima Farheen Mirza, which is one of the books I'm reading for my Indian and um, Middle Eastern priority for March, which is like the first book that I picked up for that and it's the middle of March. Um, but it started out really strong, very beautiful writing, actually kind of similar writing in just that luscious feel to Aaron Morgenstern, so that was kind of interesting. I read maybe 15% of that. It's a family saga about an Indian American family who there's some difficulties with the children versus the parents and a lot of cultural things. So I'm not very far into it, but it's it's good so far. And then I listened to a little bit of an audiobook um, by John Hodgman called uh, Medallion Status. And this is something that I started reading a couple of listening to a couple of weeks ago because John Hodgman was supposed to be on the cruise that we were going on. Um, but he had been to Italy and so he was banned from boarding the cruise. So when I found out he wasn't going to be on it, I put that on pause. I was like, okay, I don't need to finish this before the cruise starts. Um, but I listened to a little bit of it uh, on the plane ride. I really like John Hodgman's writing. I love he narrates his own um, audiobooks, and it's just I love his humor. His humor really, really works for me. I find his writing kind of um, both beautiful while being a little bit of satire and fun and it's just I get a lot out of his books so I definitely want to finish this book although I did have to return my library copy so I'll have to get it back sometime later to finish it uh, and then yeah we got home and now I am uh, catching up on everything that's been going on in the world for the past week while we were mainly without internet especially the last five days of the cruise I think we just didn't have any internet so there's a lot that's been going on and uh, was interesting because the cruise line we were on Holland America announced um, when we got back that cruises were suspended for a month so we were like the last cruise group of cruises to come back so that was interesting um, and then we flew back home and now we're 
learning all of the things that are closed, like all the schools and the libraries and the restaurants and just everything is being closed. So it's like, okay, interesting. So welcome back home. Uh, in any case, I hope that you guys enjoyed this vlog. Um, it was interesting timing to go on a cruise, but we still really enjoyed what we got to see. Um, and for anybody who is interested in going on the Joko cruise in the future, I think that it's a really cool kind of nerd convention at sea. So if you like that sort of thing, it might be right up your alley. I know there's people who have gone on it like every year since it started 10 years ago. So, you know, it might work for you. Um, in any case, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching and let me know any thoughts that you have down in the comments below. I'd love to hear anything you have to say.